Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. Good morning, friends. Episode 312. Wow. Why is time flying fast on us? So I want to announce something. So we kicked off this Monday episode starting in June, and we're still tinkering a little bit with the format. And I think we finally settled on something that will serve you well. And so since the start, we've been committed to a few things. One, long episode Thursdays, short episode on Mondays. And of course, you know, short for us is an hour or less. Uh, but the episodes have you know ranged from 38 minutes to an hour. And we've been committed to an interview. And that has not changed. We will always have an interview. I won't say always, but for the foreseeable future, there's no plans not to have an interview. And we have so many guests lined up. So I just don't see that changing. I just can't see it changing. So we'll have an interview for sure uh, as part of the podcast. And in the past, some of the things we've done, we've had higher ed updates a lot. And then sometimes we've had higher ed updates and a question from a listener and and bonus content. We've had all three. So here's what I think is going to work best moving forward. We will have one of those three. It will either be higher ed updates or question from a listener, speak pipe, or just emailed in. We prefer speak pipe, but there are some people that are too shy to do speak pipe. And so we still want to respect them um, or bonus content. Now, why would we do this? Well, we really value what questions you have. That's very important to us. So for example, right now, Lisa and I have a four part series going on on the question for a listener segment on Thursdays. Meanwhile, questions are coming in and some of them are time sensitive. Some of them are some singers who are making decisions now. And so what we don't wanna do is say, okay, we'll answer that question in seven weeks and then it's too late for you. So this is what you can expect moving forward. We won't be as committal about what, which of those three things we'll do higher ed updates, question from listener, or bonus content. Sometimes bonus content hits me and it, it just, all of a sudden three people ask the same question. It's really important. I feel like I need to address it. Like I said, a question can come in. It's really time sensitive and we need to address it. And higher ed updates is always there. We do want to keep you in touch with what's going on in the world of higher ed. So hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Expect one of those three and the interview moving forward. And we're really not going to find out which which one of the three it is until the Monday episode, because there could be, like I said, literally three pressing questions that could come in just before we're about to record, and we might th throw an audible in there. But today, we're back to higher ed updates. There's only a couple, so let's dive right in. So I mentioned a few weeks ago that Columbia University was the first Ivy League school to say they will be test optional indefinitely. What I never mentioned is that the College of William and Mary made the same commitment around the same time, first week of March. So this is not brand new news, but it's brand new on our podcast. So after they were doing a three-year experiment and being test optional for three years to gather data. When schools are doing those experiments, basically what they're trying to do is ascertain whether they can admit appropriate students without test scores. Apparently, the, the study was successful because they've gone from that three-year experiment to saying test optional um, indefinitely. Once again, I can't underscore, anytime a school is test optional, still always better to have good scores than no scores. It's just that no scores are better than bad scores and bad scores will be completely independent or completely dependent on the school you're applying to. All right, next story. Wellesley students are demanding what's called trans inclusivity. So, you know, one of the challenges you have at a women's college is what do you do about transgender men who want to enroll? Are you going to give them women status or are you going to say, no, you're really a man? 
How are you a biological man? Like, how are you going to handle that? Well, what's happening right now is a brouhaha on the campus because students at Wellesley are pushing for administrative change. Um, it took a survey of their students, and they feel as if the school should ha allow trans men to be admitted to the school. Um, they feel very strongly about it. They've been outspoken. They've been loud. They've been forceful in their belief. They've had a student-led non-binding referendum that happened a few weeks ago um, as part of the institution's yearly student government elections. And the referendum basically is asking administrators to use non-gendered language in other communications rather than referring to the Wellesley community with terms like alumni or women. However, they don't get the say. The students don't control what actually is going to happen. So uh, Wellesley has issued a statement that says Wellesley College acknowledges the result of the non-binding student ballot initiative. However, although there is no plan to revisit its mission as a women's college or its admissions policy, the college will continue to engage all students, including, including transgender male and non-binary students, in the important work of building an inclusive academic community. So basically, the president, uh, with the support of the board, is saying, we hear you, but you don't get the right to dictate our policy here, and we're not persuaded by your referendum. So that's where things stand right now. Okay, and the last story, and this is the biggest one, I'm definitely pop, and I want to spend most of my time on it. So we've been talking for a while about this new FAFSA, oftentimes called Simplified FAFSA, this has been announced since 2020, and Mark Kantrowitz on to do an in-depth, over an hour conversation about the new simplified FAFSA, what it's going to mean, why it's happening, what the changes will occur, how will the, I was going to say the EFC, Expected Family Contribution, change, but it's now going to be called a Student Aid Index, which is actually something I support, because that was a terrible name. When I hear Expected Family Contribution, I think that's how much I expect to contribute, and it's not what it meant, so why would you have such a dumb name? Anyway. There have been concerns about this for a while because it's such a massive undertaking. So it was already delayed a year in terms of the rollout. And, you know, anytime you have major initiatives like this, there's oftentimes kinks that can last for years in the transition. So what happened is that there had been a lot of pressure that was being brought on the Department of Education, primarily from a lot of access groups as well as NASFA which is the National Association of Financial Aid Administrators that, you know, they got to know how these things work because they're the ones that going to implement the policies at their schools and take the heat, saying, we got to know what's going on. So finally, an announcement was made. Um, it just came out this week that just for this year, FAFSA will be delayed and rolled out in December. Now, this, they're saying when you go to 25, 26, it'll be back to October. But for this year, it's going to be December rollout. Now, the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, is completed by more than 17 million students every year. So a lot of people complete FAFSA, okay? If you want to get um, access to federal money, whether that is need-based need -based grants like the Pell Grant or FSCOG, or if you want to get uh, one of the best loans possible, the Federal Direct Student Loan, or the Parent Plus Loan, or the Work Study Program, or a lot of states will use FAFSA for their state-based aid, and some institutions even use FAFSA for their institutional aid, you got to fill it out. So everybody's wondering what's going on here. So let's just take a step back. So it was in 2020 that these changes were announced, and that another term you'll hear used, the redesigned FAFSA, there's so many names for it, simplified redesign, um, supposed to kick in 23-24, then push back to 24-25. So think about it this way, the current sophomore class this is going to be the form that you're going to have to complete. And they've announced that it will not be out until December rather than October. Now, for the most part, access organizations are commending this statement. One, at least there's some clear communication. And two, they were smart enough to not only say it will be out in December, but they said a series of other things are going to happen, such as they were going to publish a testing and demonstration website for counselors and financial aid administrators that's going to go up early in order to help students, staff, family navigate themselves through the process. 
There's some other things as well that are going to happen, a series of webinars and other forms of communication are going to be made available to explain the, the, the rollout. So they did have a pretty good plan in terms of what they're going to do to educate people. To be honest, I'm still a little bit skeptical. This is such a major overhaul that I just ex I'm just expecting kinks. We already have a lot of confusion because one of the things in the new simplified FAFSA is that it treats multiple kids in college very, very differently than it previously did. And a lot of people are freaking out about that. Are they all of a sudden going to have their cost of college explode when they thought it would be potentially less with two kids in college? The one thing that I'll say about that, that I think it's overblown, most of the schools that meet a family's full need, they don't use the FAFSA. They use the CSS profile. They just don't. So whether whether or not your EFC changes with multiple kids in college, what you actually pay has not been tethered to the FAFSA's EFC for the overwhelming majority of colleges. The times when this can come into play is if you would be eligible for federal money like a Pell Grant or FSCOG with multiple kids in college, and now you won't. And that's going to be for more modest income families. The other reason why I think people shouldn't freak out about this is I do think that financial aid administrators who are empowered to employ professional judgment, I do think that they will be em employing professional judgment for the families that were going to all of a sudden experience a significant increase over from one year to the next. But I get how the uncertainty of the process creates the angst and the trepidation. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Okay, friends, we are about to continue our interview with Gloria and Terry Crawford, founders of Initial View, the ed tech company that's doing a couple of things. They're helping colleges to ascertain, is this person truly authentic that's applying to verify their identity? Also allow them to speak more in their own voice. They're also giving students an opportunity uh, to be heard in a new way. We've talked a lot about what they've done internationally in part three or four. There'll be a lot more talk about their domestic product elevator pitch and how it can help students here at home that are looking to stay in U.S. schools and are curious how Initial View can help them. Listen and enjoy. So before you get to the ChatGPT, you may remember uh, when we were meeting, you one thing you shared with me about this, and I thought this was brilliant, it was your star system. And um, just because knowing how admissions officers think, and they're very conscious of yield, much more so than the public thinks, can you talk a little bit about the the star system you implemented and how that works and how sort of that's been received? I mean, th this is another example of something that we just kind of stumbled into. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I think that, that I enjoy, as I, I enjoy reading uh, uh, quasi academic articles on on areas that are maybe adjacent uh, to, to admissions. And, and a lot of people have written, uh, typically economists have written about the, the nature of what, what they call two-sided markets. And, and, uh, uh, you know, admissions is a two-sided market in the sense that you have, uh, you have the, 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 you know, the, the admission officers and the colleges on one side and you have the, the students and the, the, the families on the other. And, and it's not, um, the, the, you know, a couple other two-sided markets, I think are kind of good examples uh, that, that bring that, that help illustrate this is of course you know the job market that's a two sided market uh, and then there's of course the dating <laughs> um, and and the notion is that the, the kind of the characteristics of these two sided markets and we'll call them two sided markets or maybe matching matching markets uh, they don't they don't typically have a price uh, that that is where you know if you want to go buy milk uh, you know you're you can just go and buy milk if you're willing to pay the the price but but that's not really true you can't necessarily you know, maybe people in their minds are thinking of exceptions to this, but typically you can't go and, uh, you know, date whoever you want to date. Uh, there's no price tag that's attached to that. You can't go and get any job you want. 
uh, you know, by paying money, there's not a price tag that's attached to that. And, and, and typically, again, we're, all of us are thinking of exceptions to this that are in the news, but, but typically you can't just go and pay a price and then go uh, attend whatever school you want to attend. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a matching process uh, that happens uh, in, in admissions. And that's kind of understanding that and understanding that, that really it's almost like a matchmaking process, I think is really helpful. If you're advising students, I think that that uh, you know, making making references to the the <laughs> the dating market as a way to kind of make this really real to students. Like, look, it's a it's a match that you're that you know you both have to be right for each other. And the I was reading uh, uh, there was a footnote in a book I was reading um, about about I think it was it was talking about dating uh, websites or you know how those worked, and it talked about this one Korean uh, dating website. That introduced this this mechanic of kind of two virtual roses, and the the issue that they had in this this uh, website is that you know people could kind of message each other whenever they wanted to, but it often wasn't a very high quality connection that was being made, and that's because it was very easy to to send these messages. So what they did is they said, okay, we're going to give every user, uh, let's say, two virtual roses, and they can only use uh, those, you know, the only two virtual roses a month or whatever. And so if you're on this platform and, you know, you receive a message, but you also receive a rose, then, you know, like, oh, there's actually, there's some, some more weight behind this. The person who sent this to me uh, is, is maybe a little bit more serious, a little more costly uh, to the person uh, to, to send this note to me. And, and when you, you know, many people here who know the, the admissions world are going to instantly realize like, oh, that's actually, something that a mechanic like that is that, that maybe students could use to convey their preference to, to colleges. And, and Mark, uh, you talked about the importance of yield. You know, there's some numbers that are very, very important uh, in the minds of admissions offices, and all of them are focused on these numbers. And it, that's something that maybe parents don't, often don't understand. You know, it's going to be the number of apps that they get. Um, it's going to be the, the yield rate. Uh, and, and you can think of it like this. If the if the the you know the, every college is going to give out some acceptances, and if if they can have a higher uh, yield, uh, if if a larger percentage of the students that receive an acceptance say yes, uh, then they can actually be more selective, uh, and that's that's very important. It's it's important to understand that. And so, what a lot of admissions offices do is they try and use this kind of big data analysis to to analyze how likely is this student going to come, a student with these characteristics. And that is very internal information. Like no one kind of understands, no one ever really knows what's in a school's model when they're predictive, when they're doing this predictive modeling. Um, but what, what we came up with is like, okay, the same way on this Korean dating website that, you know, you can give a rose, you have one of, you know, two roses to give a month. We give every student, uh, we give them two uh, virtual stars. Uh, and so they have two stars that each cycle they can give to two of their top choices. And it's really only for regular decision. Uh, you know, you've got early decision and that's in a sense, a star in itself, a way of conveying your preference, a very uh, uh, convincing one. Um, and then, but then for regular decision uh, students, you know, you could be doing our interview. You're going to get these two, these two stars. Uh, and, and uh, if you're doing our elevator pitch, you also get these two stars. And now, you know, as you're as you're being strategic, uh, um, uh, you know, thinking about how to apply to these to these schools, and again, you want to stand out in the process. Um, these two virtual stars are, are a great way to do it because it kind of flows directly into the software which most uh, admissions offices use. They've come up with tools to search for these stars. Uh, it's it's not tied to uh, uh, you know performance or or how much money you pay or any, you know, whether you visit the campus or anything like that, but it is convincing uh, because admissions offices know that we restrict um, these stars that, that we give to, that we give to students. And it, it, you know, we understand how admissions offices think. We think that, that the ability to insert your voice, the use of video, uh, how compelling it is for an admission officer once a student understands the student better, that is very compelling and very important. But, but there might, the reason you come and use our services, like, you know, if you're in the U.S., it might be just because you want these stars. It might be because you just want to, how do I differentiate my, how do I show this college in this other state that I am really serious about their school? Uh, one, I mean, we think one of the most convincing ways you can do that is by using uh, these virtual stars. And so, you know, if you're in the U.S. and you're doing our elevator pitch, it's a, it's a, um, 
the the you know it only costs 22 bucks if you don't want to pay 22 bucks then you qualify for a waiver a very broad waiver that you click through and you take advantage of it i mean and to you know there are very few things in the admissions process that are kind of a no brainer uh, i mean i think this this just squarely fits right in that category if if you understand matching markets and you understand the 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 metrics that admissions officers are concerned about you're going to realize like oh that is something that I should be taking advantage of because I have preferences. There are some schools I prefer over others, and I want to convey to those schools that I'm very serious about their school. And and uh, you know, there, there's no other good way to do that uh, in the the admissions market today. We've all heard that story, right? Of you know the student who writes. Um, and my dream school is Georgia Tech. And then the last sentence, and that is why I want to go to Duke. And you're, you're like, oh, no, the copy and paste. Um, and, and so that type of, you know, idea of demonstrated interest has been in our world for a long time, but kind of misunderstood, I think, and not really thought about um, strategically. Um, and even when we were starting to figure out, you know, why do we do just one pitch versus 10, you know, for specific schools, it was because we were worried about this kind of, well, we just say what we think that the school wants us to hear and it's not genuine. The signaling tool really forces a family to kind of sit down and think like, okay, I, at the end of the day, I can only go to one, <laughs> you know, like I want, yeah, sure. Uh, bragging rights to be able to say I got into 10 schools, but really at the end of the day, we just want to go to one. And so what is a way that we can really kind of pare down this list and think through what school is right for me? And that school that's right for me may not be always readily apparent. You know, we've heard this, um, the idea of, you know, yield protection or whatever, you know, like that, that has come up in some forums of parents being like, oh, that kid didn't get in, even though they were supposed to get in because of yield protection. Um, I think we, you know, if we kind of think that way and try to kind of game the process, that's not what we're trying to go for. So I like the educational piece of the signaling as well. Like, look, you've got two emissions officers know you have two. use them well. Think about, you know, maybe the school doesn't realize that you have an aunt and uncle that live in that town and that city, and that's why you really want to go there. Yes, you might be, you might look overqualified on this piece of paper, but if you're able to share your preference, it's a little bit different than what we have traditionally called demonstrated interest. And it's accessible to everybody. You don't have to be able to get on a plane and fly to the school to show your interest. You can just assign the star. So I have two questions. One, how well has the STAR system been received by colleges? And then secondly, I like it, but I'm thinking kind of like an admissions person when I say that I like it. I could also see some criticism, meaning, well, if I can send this video to six schools and I didn't STAR you, I immediately signaled to you that I'm not interested and and now that hurts me. So what would, I'd love for you to kind of address both of those things. Like, how colleges have received the star system. And I'm sure I'm not the first person to bring that, bring up that alternative argument and sort of what's your answer to that? Well, the, the notion about, uh, I mean, I mean, college, you know, we talked about kind of the model, the predictive model that colleges have. And, and of course that is, that is really kind of honed and crafted even after once they get all of their, their apps in. So you're never going to know what is in a college's model, uh, uh, you know, for, for that. I mean, that really is probably tweaked even up to the final weeks before they decide uh, who to who to admit. But what we can say is that we know that admissions offices have built tools internally to track uh, these stars. Uh, and so so we know um, that that's very important. I mean, some schools do are straight up about it. Like they'll just tell you, like, we, we love seeing the stars, you know, so it, it's not it's not a, um, you know, it's not necessarily a make or break thing, but they do say that they that they want it. And, and, um, you know, again, uh, it's one of these scenarios where you have to understand the market forces that are impacting admissions offices and then kind of come up with responses or tools that are going to help them deal with that. Uh, and then once you understand that, you see the rationale like, OK, that's why, you know, that's why this tool is is helpful to admissions offices. Uh, and, and I think it's, you know, to piggyback, to continue with what Gloria was saying, I mean, it is helpful to the student. I mean, students do have preferences. Uh, they're they're applying to a range of schools, a range of selectivity. 
uh, they would, the, the, you know, is, is, um, you know, a star going to get you into Harvard? Well, probably not. I mean, but, but the, but there's a, you know, but once you kind of move down a little bit, I mean, it could, it could definitely make a big difference. And maybe, you know, you have two, so, you know, maybe use one for a reach school and one a little bit more for a safety, just to, just to, to make sure that it's clear. Um, you know, the notion that you said about, well, what about, what about, uh, you know, the, the schools that don't get a star? I mean, you know, I appreciate the, the optimism in that statement that, that someday our influence is going to be so great that, that uh, uh, admissions offices will be, will be uh, you know, waiting on every, every tool they receive from initial view. I mean, I'm just not sure that we're there yet. Uh, and, and, and I, and I want to emphasize, too, you know, I mean, we're just a tool in the regular decision. So if you find yourself in regular decision, I mean, you should definitely take advantage of it. It's not something that happens in ED. A lot of admissions happens in ED. You know, we're, we're talking in the selective school uh, realm here. Um, and, but, I, but I also would say, uh, you know, let's, let's suppose that, that uh, a school says they didn't give us a star, so we're going to wait list them. We're not so sure that, you know, so we're going to put them on a wait list. Well, guess what? Initial View has a single yellow rose. But if they are <laughs> waitlisted, you give them a single yellow rose. And these are all signaling tools, you know, and now this kind of harkens again. It is, it is a matchmaking process, just like The Bachelor. Where you know you, the the you're able if you're waitlisted you have a single yellow rose all of a sudden things have changed and you're like oh I actually do they they are my top choice you give them your single yellow rose I mean colleges are all telling us like oh this is great because you know when it comes to waitlist time like 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 the the number one reason we keep someone on a waitlist is because we think they're still serious about our school so so the the you know so we're all of these th- these mechanics that that uh, uh, y- you know we kind of have a response for, but I will go back to what Gloria said. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you student have a preference, and you have to think about where what's going to be right for you. And and I think everyone feels that if the response of every student is like, "Well, I'm just going to send off 20 apps, and we're just going to see what happens," like that's not that's not a way to that's a lot of resources are going to be wasted. Um, a lot of, of admissions officer resources are wasted. I mean, they could be using that uh, for people who are less resourced but are really serious about their school. Um, and so, so it's it really, uh, you know, it's about what are ways that kind of make the process more fair for everyone. Uh, and and you know, with this this notion of kind of being able to signal with credibility, uh, we think there's just no question. As has happened in other market, you know, job markets and and dating markets, uh, if it if it was used to a greater degree. Uh, in admissions, it would be better for everyone. I'll add to that in the sense that an admission officer once told me, she, she said, you know, um, these applications are touched multiple times. We're not making a decision from the first read. And so if you think about even dating, sure, you know, if I was on this dating website and I used a virtual rose, you know, maybe the match would be faster or it would be, you know, uh, a more... Uh, quicker realization that this works. But thinking back on my relationship with Terry, even like it took a little bit of time before we realized like, okay, let's go for this. And so even an elevator pitch is like, I can see an admissions officer saying, wow, what he said right there, that is match. That is fit at our school. And so even the elevator pitch itself without the star is a signal. It's thinking like, oh, I can actually see you on my campus. I actually really want you here. And so maybe I need to do the winning over when I accept you. And then the yield event happens. I'm I'm doing my signaling at that point, or I'm giving aid because I really want you to be there. So it's not so cut and dry here. It is holistic admissions. It isn't one piece that makes it or breaks it. But the star is just another way to be like, okay, here's another piece of information that might be helpful to you. Well, well, what Gloria is alluding to is that my initial elevator pitch to her when we first met was less than successful, <laughs> but, 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 but fortunately, you know, there are other ways to signal my interest uh, and that, that eventually it made her feel special. And she realized like, okay, maybe I'll give them uh, another chance. <laughs> you, you landed the deal. That's all I could say. So, so, so if we go back to that episode 299, Susan was talking about how she'd used initial view as a reader before primarily for international applicants, but, 
we were talking about ChatGPT and she was speculating, seems like this could be a good place for, for initial view domestically. Um, have you seen an increased interest even in the last, you know, couple months since ChatGPT broke out for other schools feeling, why not see if you can incorporate this into part of our solution to suss out inauthenticity? Well, well, I think one of the things that is so exciting about about ChatGPT and and everyone listening here should just first of all they should know that it is here. Uh, ChatGPT ChatGPT is not going away. The ability to to put together very polished uh, pieces of text uh, is only going to get better. That is that is not changing, uh, and I think even even more so, restricting access uh, could be detrimental. Uh, because students are not learning how to how to use these tools. Um, one on the the advantage of ChatGPT or the opportunity that it brings is that it's the impetus for us to all think again about how are we doing admissions. The 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 you know this notion of kind of a of a test uh, you know then that we're going to use that test score and that test is going to play a very very big role uh, in determining uh, one's future. I mean that that's really. You know, even even people who like tests would say like, oh, but that's kind of not the best. You know, it's not the best, but it's it's all we can do. You know, that's the only way that admissions offices can get through thousands of applications that they have a number. Um, I mean, I think now and initial view is an example of this. Uh, you know, it, it you can actually leverage uh, networks. Let's say it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, high school AP teachers uh, throughout the country. Uh, you know, you can hire them to interview students about their their US history class or their econ class or uh you know their calculus I mean whatever class it could be but th- these can be uh discussions that are subject matter specific uh they are unscripted but they're a way for the student to demonstrate that they are that they're ready again to engage in the classroom and and what's so wonderful about this is that you know the, the admissions offices they could receive these conversations they could they could uh, process them the same way that they process our interviews. Faculty could look at these conversations and they could recruit uh, the student when they see, see the student. And what's so wonderful is like, we're not even talking about a test score here. Uh, we're talking about the student demonstrating that they are ready to engage on a college campus. And again, if you take a step back, the whole re- the, what we all care about is engagement. That, that, that's what we care about. We don't care about even... It, you know, are we going to admit the the student that that always gets everything right? I mean, that that even that is not really the goal of admissions. The goal is to admit a student who is going to be able to engage on a college campus. Uh, you know, is going to have sapient skills, going to be able to uh, engage with their classmates and their their professors in a way that makes impact. Uh, and and so you can imagine, you know, the the emphasis now shifting away from. Uh, you know, uh, from from grades or, or from a test. I mean, of course, this is already happening, right? This is not even just ChatGPT, but even more so. The I think people are going to realize like we need something else here. Uh, it, it is not it is not going to be a, a score that we're going to look at. What we want to see is we want to we want to understand. You know, how can a student think on their feet? Uh, how can a student engage with an adult? Uh, how can a student um, the the talk about a, sophistic, a sophisticated topic? And and you know, up until now. That was you could not do that at scale. It was not something where you could you could you could you know do do thousands of these or tens of thousands of these uh, you know in a very short period of time. Um, but now you can. And and so what's so exciting about ChatGPT is that is that look this notion that that hey uh, you know turn in a graded paper or uh, you know the, the we want to see um, the the you know so the, a test score or whatever it might be. I mean th- those. The, the importance of that is going to continue to decline, uh, and the the emphasis upon what we really care about is only going to increase. And and it's not, you know, it's not necessarily uh, uh, a result of ChatGPT. But what it really more so is is you know ChatGPT is forces all to ask the question like what are the skills that are really important for us to have? Like that's that's what it really is. I mean, it is not actually crafting uh, a. a um, you know, a short answer response uh, that that is just recalling facts in our head. Like that is actually not important. Friends, this concludes the part three. We hope you'll join us next week for the final part. On Thursday's episode, 
Why are more institutions not following Colorado College and RISD? Karen Kristoff will be joining us again, the Assistant Vice President and Dean of Admissions at Colorado College. This is the first of what we're going to continue to do, which is have an actual admission officer as part of our In the News team every third month. And we'll be talking about a hot decision they made. Just jump out of U.S. News and World Report and everything that went into it. No better person to have here than the Assistant Vice President and Dean of Admissions. Lisa and I will continue our question segment in a four-parter, and we're looking at seven groups of students that are often disillusioned with the college admission process. Why are they disillusioned? What can we do to help them not be disillusioned? And we'll be getting into reasons two and three of the seven in part two of this four-parter. And we have a brand new interview, and it is with a legend in the world of admissions, Andre Phillips, who is about to enter year 40. And he is the director of admissions at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And he'll be helping us to understand UW-Madison. It'll be a four-parter. And then for our spotlight, Kevin Newton continues helping us to understand Australian universities. And friends, I cannot emphasize enough, it's decision-making time for people when it comes to college for the senior class. Just remember, it's not where you go. It's not where you go. It's not where you go. But it's what you do when you get there, and it's what you do when you get out of there. That is what will determine your career trajectory. See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff. Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joy Stucker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stalianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website, where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is yourcollegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.